Hello, and welcome to the sky at night. And what better place to be than here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich? Like all our museums, it's currently closed to the public, but they're using their time well, getting ready for visitors when they can open again. In the meantime, you're in the best place for all things astronomical. In February, three probes reached Mars. The UAE's HOPE will be analysing the planet's atmosphere, and China's Shenzhen-1 will be studying its geology. Maggie will be talking to the chief engineer of NASA's Perseverance rover about the challenges of landing on and exploring the red planet. We've settled on the SkyTrain approach, and we called it the least unacceptable solution. <laughs> At the end of February, we had our own interplanetary visitor in the shape of a dramatic fireball that landed in Gloucestershire. Chris got privileged access to what remains of the meteorite, now safely in storage at the Natural History Museum. Holding this, knowing that a couple of weeks ago it was in space, is a special moment. And learned about the remarkable track and trace story behind its discovery. You all line up in a line, looking at all the meteor wrongs from sheep poo to spider webs. And Maggie will be paying tribute to her hero, Yuri Gagarin, who became the first human in space 60 years ago this month. Can you really honestly say that you did not have any butterflies in the tummy before you started? <laughs> yes, I can assure you there were no butterflies, moths, or anything else in my stomach. <laughs> Welcome to the sky at night. the best time of year to see shooting stars. And yet, on the 9th of February the 28th, our skies were lit up by a spectacular fireball. And, unusually for an event like this, it was caught on camera. It's entered the atmosphere at about 30,000 miles per hour. A sonic boom was heard by many, and it's fragmented on its way down. Creating a media storm, the meteorite landed in Gloucestershire, mainly on somebody's driveway. A number of you uh, on Twitter saying that you saw that at 9.54 p.m. What's more remarkable is that its discovery was no accident, but the result of hard work by the UK Fireball Alliance. Luke Daly is one of the scientists involved. Well, Luke, it's, it's lovely to talk to you. It's such an exciting story. Tell us about the network. How many cameras? There are maybe six or seven networks involved under the umbrella of the UK Fireball Alliance. They use lots of different cameras from just off the shelf uh, CCTV cameras to digital cameras. By using information from many different cameras, the Fireball's trajectory was plotted. The main landing zone was the town of Winchcombe. And so because of this network, we can connect the point of light in the sky to something that, that you can hold in your hand. That's pretty special. Oh God, yeah, it's amazing. The sort of work that's gone in to generate all these models to be able to predict where these things would land and then be able to go get them. When did you hear that something had been found? I knew about the driveway Wednesday, and then we were on the ground on the Thursday. I think people will have this image of a, you know, with high tech meteorite detecting equipment, some sort of laptop open. It's not like that, is it? No. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, sort of like search and rescue techniques. You all line up in a line uh, about two to three meters apart and just walk across the landscape looking down for little black rocks. It's very old school, but very effective search and rescue techniques that we employ. And did you find any pieces yourself? Yeah, and that was a really amazing sort of moment. And it was uh, actually my girlfriend, Mira, who was in her lane. She just stopped, looked down and was like, uh, can you check this out? I think this could be it. I've got no clever words right now. Uh, I'm over the moon. It's this beautiful, about 150 gram intact fragment uh, that was just sort of like embedded in the mud. Wow, kind of. look at that. It's massive. An unbelievable feeling that we can do this. So how rare is this sort of event? 
every year over the UK, we should get one meteorite of a searchable size falling on us. However, actually recovering the thing is really hard. The last time that happened was over 30 years ago. We should get one a year and we're missing them all. And that's where the sort of UK Fireball Alliance comes in, uh, being able to see these fireballs, being able to figure out where they landed and sort of refine that search area and hopefully go get them. Once Luke and the team had found the remains of the meteorite, they were brought here, to the Natural History Museum in London. This is where the National Collection of Meteorites is kept. You can see several of them scattered throughout the museum, but the real action happens behind the scenes. I've come to meet Helena Bates, curator of the meteorite collection. Well, thanks for having us and showing us around. No I guess my, my first question is, what is a meteorite? Well, essentially, it's a rock from space. So most meteorites come from asteroids, which are the building blocks of planets. Uh, some come from Mars and some come from the Moon, but um, most of them come from asteroids, and that's what's exciting, in my opinion. So all of our meteorites are kept in these very old-fashioned looking cabinets. It's proper old-school museum stuff. I know. Stuff, it right? looks very museum-y, which I quite like. This is an iron meteorite. So we think that this actually was kind of insulated inside a planet. So we think it was a core. And so we think this is actually representative of what our core on Earth looks like. So that's the iron meteorite. We also have stony iron meteorites. So these come from the point at which you have uh, the iron core touching your rocky mantle. And so an example is behind you. OK, this thing? Yes, it's quite heavy. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's heavy. I can confirm that that's heavy. Yeah. Viewers. Um, <laughs> So this is a polished piece yeah, of it, Yes, so right? we've sliced it so that you can see inside. So it's basically a mix of metal and rock. OK, hence stony, hence stony, stony iron. iron. OK, yeah. I'm getting the hang of this. And what else can we look at? So obviously we've gone through the irons and the stony irons, but we also have stony meteorites, my favourite meteorites. Stony meteorites don't come from very large bodies. They actually come from bodies that were a bit smaller, so they didn't have any melting on their interior. So this is a beautiful sample of a stony <laughs> meteorite. And we think these are literally the material before planets accreting together and they're just kind of sticking together, nothing happened to it. But there is a type of stony meteorite that is, has, is similar, but it has had something quite unique happen to it. What we have here is my favourite type, the most underwhelming of the pieces we've got out. I mean, it looks <laughs> like a pebble. It, mm -hmm, I will admit that. Can you I could, pick, can yes, I pick? do touch it, and I would advise you to touch it, okay. because it's a very, very special rock. So this is what we call a carbonaceous chondrite. So it's got quite high carbon content, this meteorite. But you see these little little white flecks and things on the inside of that meteor? Yeah, yeah, for sure. They're called calcium-aluminium inclusions. These are, if we kind of model the beginning of the solar system, you have your star in the middle and then lots of gas surrounding it. Solids began to condense out of that gas. And those calcium-aluminium inclusions, those little white flecks, are the first solids to form in the solar system. You just casually had me something <laughs> older than the Earth. Yeah, I did, yeah. See, meteorites are cool. Meteorites are amazing. This is the type that was found at Winchcombe. We think Winchcombe is a carbonaceous chondrite. So it's one of these super duper old um, meteorites. So amazing. The scientist responsible for looking after the precious Winchcombe meteorite and coordinating the research effort is Ashley King. All of the material that's been recovered so far is safely stored away in these boxes here. So these are desiccators, they're temperature and humidity controlled to try and minimise their contamination with the terrestrial atmosphere. And if we could get one of those out, I'm not going to ask to do that. <laughs> what would they look like? We actually have a few bits that okay. I can show you if you want to put some gloves on. All right. Let's take this little one out. These ones are mainly made up of kind of like a clay. So they're made up of phyllosilicate minerals or clay minerals that have got H2O bonds on them. And so it means they're really, really soft. You know what it looks like to me? It looks like an oxo cube. Oh, yeah, yeah, it looks yeah, like you could yeah, crumble yeah, yeah. it into, crumble. into something. Yeah, some of them, you literally kind of look at them and they crumble. <laughs> so they're very fragile. So we're excited because this is a British meteorite. But how exciting is this in a global context? Are, are people around the world excited by this? Yes, it's incredibly rare to get material collected after a meteorite falls so quickly, to get such fresh material. It's even rarer for that to be a carbonaceous chondrite type. Why is the fact that it's a carbonaceous chondrite so exciting? These are the most pristine extraterrestrial materials that we can get our hands on. One of the things that we're really interested in using carbonaceous chondrites for is to understand the building blocks of life and why, you know, why do we have oceans on the Earth? Why did Mars have oceans? And so all that information, simple organic materials, things like amino acids, water-bearing minerals from the 
birth of our solar system are locked up in this. What's really exciting about this one is that we have that fireball, that camera data. So we have like a pre-atmospheric orbit. We know roughly how big the object was. We have something like 65,000 meteorites in our, in our collections. About 40 of those actually have a, a pre-atmospheric orbit. And even those people who got things on doorbell cameras and dash cams, that's all really useful for us. And for this one, we know that the orbit goes out somewhere close to Jupiter. It's an amazing thing. Can I pick it up? I just want to hold it again. Yeah, 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 go for it. Is that all right? I I promise not to break it. There's just just something, holding this, knowing that this started its life out near Jupiter and that a couple of weeks ago it was in space is, is a special moment. I mean, I've worked with carbonaceous chondrites for, for, for nearly 10 years now, and I've never seen one so fresh, so dark. And we're really, really excited to, to work with everybody. You know, all the UK scientists are kind of waiting for us to say go, and you know, we'll fire all the different electrons and X-rays that we can at it. Well, we'll come back and talk to you when you've got the results, yeah. but it's a wonderful find. Congratulations, really, and, and we'll you. talk to you soon. When this place was built, the idea of visiting another planet would have been nothing but a dream. But just a few weeks ago, three separate missions arrived at Mars. One from China, one from the UAE, and NASA landed its fifth rover on the surface of the red planet. Like all vehicles sent to Mars, Perseverance is a near miracle in space engineering. The team that built it are led by a man who was once told that he'd never amount to more than being a ditch digger. That's NASA's Adam Stelzner. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Well, Maggie, I'm very happy to be here. I guess you're very glad you didn't go for the ditch digging in the end. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, actually. Although I do love outdoors and working in the out of doors, spacecraft engineering pays a lot better (laughs) and it's a little easier on your back. (laughs) So good on both counts. Yes. Yes. Adam, you were instrumental in getting both curiosity and perseverance to the Martian surface. But as the saying goes, sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. So what were the the missions that came before these two that helped Uh, you get down there safely? Great question. So the modern exploration of Mars, the modern epic, really started in about uh, 1997 with the Pathfinder mission. Tiny little microwave oven sized rover put on the surface of Mars. It was a grand technology development experiment. The NASA administrator at the time said, if we make it to the launch pad, the experience will have been a success. That's a pretty low bar for going to Mars. <laughs> and in 2003, we did two missions, two launches, and they were sizing about a, a golf cart, 175 kilos. That was a tremendous challenge, but both missions, spirit and opportunity, successfully made it to the surface of Mars. We followed on eight years later with Curiosity. Curiosity was 900 kilos. That's a big difference. And that's where we needed to develop the sky crane landing system that then we reused to put Perseverance on. And Perseverance got a little bit porky. She's a, a metric ton. When I first heard about sort of uh, the sky crane, to me it sounded like a James Bond movie. And it sounded, it just, it sounded complicated, but you pulled it off. Well, you know, when we were looking for a way of landing it, we settled on the sky crane approach and we called it the least unacceptable solution. So we didn't like it either. It just was not as bad as any of the other options we had. As the first pictures started coming through, how did you feel? We got these images of the sky crane happening from the rover, looking up, looking up at the descent stage as it lowers you to the ground, from the descent stage, looking down at the rover. So that was um, mind blowing for me. Tango Delta, nominal. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance, safely on the surface of Mars. Perseverance different from sort of previous rovers? We started with the plans of Curiosity. We rearranged the avionics, the computers, the power systems, the radios around inside of her to make room for a sampling system. The main objective of Perseverance is to take 20 to 40 rock cores from the Martian surface and seal them in phenomenally clean 
annoyingly clean, <laughs> hermetically sealed vessels and return them to Earth with the work of two follow-on missions. And so that's a big challenge for us. We got to bring these samples back. And this is a collaboration with the European Space Agency. You guys are building a, a rover in Stevenage, the sample fetch rover, as we call it. Why bring samples back to Earth? Why not analyze uh -huh. them in situ? Bringing the samples here allows us to use the full range of science equipment here on Earth. Scientists here on Earth, all of the great minds of the world can be brought to bear to understand, unravel, and unlock the mysteries of Mars. Adam and his team have delivered a beautiful piece of engineering. Another eye-catching aspect of the mission is the striking imagery of the Martian surface that has been pouring in since Perseverance touched down. Here's planetary scientist Bryony e. Horgan with an expert's guide to what the 20 megapixel cameras are showing us. So on the horizon around us, you can see what looks like mountains. And this little divot back here in the crater rim, you can see back here, this little V, that's actually where an ancient river three or four billion years ago cut through the rim of this crater. So you bring water into this crater and form a lake. So the big goal for this mission is to look for signs of ancient life in these ancient lake sediments to collect samples and then bring them back to Earth to confirm whether or not life was ever there. That's the reason why we're in Jezero Crater. So here you can actually see the delta that was created when this river flowed through the crater rim. And if we zoom in on the delta, you can see lots and lots of layers, right? And they're not all flat. If we zoom in on this area right here, you can see that these layers are actually tilted. And we think that might've been because they formed in an ancient river channel. The other thing we're going to be looking for are places where there might be muds that were deposited on the bottom of the lake or preserved, because those are the best place to look for preserved organic materials. We know from Earth, the muddiest deposits are the place that have the best chances of finding signs of life. And as we move along the delta to the north, one thing we've noticed is there are some really big boulders uh, sort of in, in this. You can see this one here, for example, we think is more than a meter across. So it's very big, right? And uh, for water to carry, a boulder that's a meter across takes a lot of energy. And one of the things we'll be trying to work out is would it have been, you know, like <laughs> a nice vacation, nice and warm and dry and, you know, getting this view of this beautiful lake from the beaches, or would it have been this cold, icy, you know, wintry, wintry place? And so that's what we're trying to figure out. Moving to the to the north away from the delta, you can see this really dark part of the crater floor. This is what we think might be part of that kind of better preserved uh, ancient lava flow that we'll be investigating in the rocks around us. One of the big decisions we have to make, where are we going to go first? We have to get to the delta itself eventually, but we have to decide, do we go north and check out this delta remnant up here, or do we head south and check out another one you can see over here on the, the far south of this panorama? And so it's a really important decision we have to make here in the upcoming weeks, and we're gathering as much data as we can. Now we're really getting to work, and it's exciting. <laughs> we have a lot of work ahead of us, for sure. Well, Maggie, I know you'd like to go to Mars, but do you think it will happen? I just love the idea of having a whole planet to explore. All that sort of easy pickings on the science. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no one could contradict you. I found it. I know what this is. <laughs> but would you? Yeah, I think so. You've got the Valles Marianas, the Grand Canyon of Mars and so on. But I think we do have to worry if, if Mars is an alive place, if there's biology, the last thing we want is big humans clomping about the place. As humans, we've done that too many times before and sort of just laid waste to places. But if there isn't life there, I just think it's such an opportunity. Yeah, and life at reduced gravity would be fun too. <laughs> yes, that... I'd be an athlete at last. <laughs> If you'd like to glimpse Mars for yourself, then look up. It's visible in the evening sky right now. Here's Pete to tell us how to find it. Okay, I've managed to get Mars through my telescope. I have to say, seeing the planet on my laptop screen here, it's a bit underwhelming. And actually, there's a good reason for that. It's because Mars is a long way away from Earth and it's moving further away Mars and Earth get close with their respective orbits every 2.1 years. Now, the mission planners take advantage of that because they know both planets are going to be close 
last time that happened was uh, early October 2020. So they launch their craft a couple of months earlier to take advantage of that close proximity. But by the time they arrived, Mars had moved away from Earth. That is a pity, but we did have a good observational period with Mars when it was really close to us. And there were some fantastic pictures and sketches made of the planet. Now, Mars is not going to be good again until middle of 2022. But without Mars, what are the other planets doing? Well, the solar system's innermost planet, which is Mercury, is actually pretty well placed late April through most of May as well. So if you've never seen Mercury before, this is the time to look out for it in the evening sky after sunset. Now, there is actually a guide to Mercury, which is quite handy, which is Venus, because Venus is also moving back into the evening sky, but it will remain quite low down. What about the gas giants then? Jupiter and Saturn, actually, are probably best seen as we go through into the summer months, so they're optimum around August time. And that's because they've been in a position in the sky which has placed them in the constellation of Sagittarius, and you don't get any lower than that. Now, there's also something exciting happening with Jupiter because in May, Jupiter experiences an equinox. That's when the sun would appear on the equatorial plane of Jupiter. Now, that's exciting because the four Galilean moons have orbits which are virtually aligned along the equatorial plane. And that means from Earth, we can see what are called mutual events. That's when the moons cast shadows on one another and they can appear to occult one another. So one moon will move in front of the other. So we'll be covering a number of those events in our online star guide, which is on the Sky at Night webpage every month. So there's a quick roundup of what we've got to look forward to. So there are some quite exciting events, those mutual events I'm really looking forward to observing and trying to photograph. So I hope that has whetted your appetite to go out and have a look at the solar system offerings. You might think of this place, the Royal Observatory Greenwich, as a monument to British astronomy. But there's someone commemorated here who comes from further afield. And Maggie, it's one of your heroes. Yeah, he really is. Now, he wasn't British or an astronomer, but it's Yuri Gagarin. And he was a childhood hero of mine because we share a birthday. He also died a few days after I was born. He's been with me throughout. <laughs> It's 60 years ago that Gagarin made his trip into space. On April the 12th, 1961, the Soviet Air Force pilot was fired through the Earth's atmosphere and into the unknown. Today, it's really hard to appreciate how brave Gagarin was. These days, putting people into low Earth orbit seems like routine, almost risk-free, like taking a transatlantic flight. But back then, Gagarin was doing something that had never been done before. Happily for Gagarin, his 108 minutes spent orbiting the Earth went precisely to plan. He returned to a rapturous reception and a promotion to the rank of major. What almost no one knew at the time was the mission was far more dangerous than it seemed. The Soviets hadn't perfected a way of bringing the cosmonaut and the capsule safely back to Earth. So soon after re-entry, Gagarin exited the spacecraft and parachuted down to Earth, leaving the capsule to crash. Now, I didn't know anything about this, but it shows what a true hero Gagarin was. Gagarin became an instant celebrity. He was the Soviet space poster boy, a key figure in the Soviet Union's charm offensive. Surging ahead in the space race with a global PR tour and a winning smile. Gagarin visited the UK soon after his historic flight and he had lunch with the Queen and Prince Philip. In the afternoon, he was interviewed by TV royalty, the BBC's Richard Dimbleby, no less. 
Yuri Gagarin. Can you really honestly say that you did not have any butterflies in the tummy before you started? <laughs> yes, I can assure you there were no butterflies, moths or anything else in my stomach. <laughs> I do think you get a sense of the man, just 27 years old, with a young family and a real sense of humour. What are you taking home to Mrs Gagarin? I would like to keep the details of this a secret since you will broadcast this and she will learn before I spring the surprise on her. We quite understand we wouldn't dream of doing it. <laughs> Here was a young man from a rural background thrust into international fame. It must have been terrifying and exciting at the same time. But the dream soon became a nightmare. The Soviet Union quickly realized that the camera and the world loved the smiling Major Gagarin. He was much too valuable an asset to be risked on their experimental and dangerous space program. Now grounded and wheeled out on a never-ending series of goodwill tools, the disenchanted Gagarin soon gained a reputation as a drinker and a womanizer. It was hard for all those space pioneers catapulted into the limelight by the glamour of the space race. The celebrity life wasn't what they expected or... international collaboration that in Yuri Gagarin's day would have seemed like an impossible dream. We would like to wish everyone here success in their work. We would like to wish them happiness and also wish them success in their efforts uh, in working for peace, which is the most important problem which is in the minds of everyone today. Next month, we'll be reviewing the latest results from the Gaia mission, looking at the Milky Way like never before. We do hope you'll join us then, and every month for the rest of the year. Until then, good, good night. night. A major new three-part series starts tomorrow over on BBC One, Greta Thunberg, A Year to Change the World. A quick look right after this. Lots to learn with BBC Sounds. Listen to Teach Me a Lesson, the podcast with Greg James and Bella Mackey. Download the app now.